welcome to episode number 21 of the Who Am I podcast with the Southside Church of Christ. We are looking into our identity as Christians and what that means in today's world. This is Brian Dill, and here with me, as always, is the sophisticated Jackson Wells. <laughs> Hello, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are very blessed to have with us Ralph Gilmore joining us from Woodbury, Tennessee. Uh, how are things in Woodbury today? It's unusually beautiful. It seems as though it rains here a lot, uh, <laughs> but it unusually it looks almost like there is a a golden sphere in the sky. All right, says, all right, that beautiful, sounds great. Beautiful, beautiful day. Beautiful day. <laughs> well, let's dive into this week's episode. All right. We are going to ask our brother Ralph Gilmore some completely random questions. I hope that you are as prepared as you can possibly be for this. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> All right. So if I remember correctly, you have done a decent amount of motorcycle riding in your lifetime. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Um, I still have a motorcycle. You do you say you still yeah. do you still get out and ride? Uh, occasionally, but not okay. as much as I used to. Well, is to is today one of those days that you should? Oh you should yeah, yeah. <laughs> I started my bike up last week just to hear it run for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are some of the places that you've been that you've really enjoyed? Well, let's see. I used to ride with a group out of Henderson, Tennessee, called the Band of Brothers, and. Uh, we uh, went to the Rocky Mountains twice on two separate occasions. I uh, went to the top of Pikes Peak one time on motorcycles. Oh, wow. Yeah, 14,110 feet. We did that. Uh, one year we went into Mexico at Del Rio. Uh, one year we went to the Blue Ridge Parkway into Pennsylvania. And, and uh, we occasionally have ridden some, you know, south into Alabama. But uh, now, I didn't go on this trip. One year, the guys went as far south as, as they could go through Miami and all the way to Key West. And I didn't go on that trip. But oh, wow. Yeah, we've been a few places. That's, That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> that, that is that is pretty cool. Oh, we've also been all the way to the Four Points area, past Colorado at Arizona, Nevada, you know, where those states come. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, we've done that, too. That's awesome. That That is really cool. <laughs> Makes me want to ride. All right. So the first time that I ever heard you speak, I believe, was at either CYC or <clears throat> EU2 or something like that. And at one of these places, from University EU. Yeah, yeah. Right. It was at it was at uh, UT Martin. It was for college kids. Oh it yeah, was a, yeah, 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 yeah. It was it that. was a lot of fun. But at one of these things, if I'm not mistaken, you were at one point in a band. Yeah, I was. Mm-hmm. Did you ever aspire to become like a, I don't know what, what kind of music y'all were singing, like a rock star or like. <laughs> no, wrong kind of music. We were playing like elevator music. Um, oh. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, Simon and Garfunkel and, and John Denver and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. that was, that was my, my genre right there. Once you get to end a hard rock, my, that's what, Caused my hair to fall out, I guess. But I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I, I played, I played guitar. Another guy played upright bass, and three girls sang. Uh, I married one of them, nearly 52 years ago. Wow! So yeah, that was a a big way that we got together. Yeah, that's called awesome. the Freedom Five. Did the Freedom it? Five. That's All right. That's a good Freedom band. Now, five. did y'all? I'm assuming did y'all form at Freed Hardman or? Uh... Did. That's, that's did. Pretty cool. Can we find any of your stuff on uh, Spotify or Apple Music? <laughs> we don't want you to. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, I have not. I, I have did. I have digitalized the two songs. You know, we just did a forty-five RPM. Y'all don't know what that was, but anyway, we just did a forty-five in uh, you know, one song on each side, and. Uh, yeah, that was back in the day. It was it, it was good. We we professionally recorded it in Birmingham. That's awesome. That's great. That's awesome. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so you also spent how many years in the classroom uh, at Fried Hardman? At Fried Hardman, 39 years. 39? Then I taught for, yeah, then I taught for a couple years before that at UT Martin. Okay, okay. And, so in, in all those years of teaching and in the classroom, what would you say is one of the funniest things that you remember happening in the midst of class? Well, traditionally... I would come into class and spit my gum at the trash can um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and just to see how far I could do that. So I was always kind of an informal teacher, I guess. Some of the stuff that we taught was kind of difficult, but, you know, kind of lightened it up a little. And so one time a guy went to sleep and I hit him with an eraser <laughs> <laughs> to wake him up. Uh, so I don't remember. I'm sure there's a lot of things that. I just can't recall right now. Thank you anyway, though. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <clears throat> All right. My, my next question is, al along with being a, a lifelong teacher and a, somebody who's an influenced a lot of Christians, you yourself have been a Christian for a long time, and that no doubt comes with struggles. What would you say is the best tool, technique, practice, or, or, or something that you have found that consistently works for you um, when you're going through a struggle or something? Well, the main thing is to make the main thing the main thing. And you've got to figure out in your life what the main thing is. Um, there's a lot of distractions, um, a lot of sickness, death, and all kinds of stuff. But what centers you all the time is Jesus, of course. You know, it sounds randomly predictable, but um, but that's it. I mean, you have to you have to recenter your thinking and refocus your thinking on what it is that you're supposed to be doing here. I'm 72 years old, and I I still look out and see a beautiful world from where I am. We we live in the hills of Middle Tennessee. It's beautiful in your part of Kentucky. And uh, to me, focusing on, in this case, nature, focusing your mind on the Bible and just remembering that at the end of the, end of the day, none of us is going to be perfect. We're all going to be dependent on grace and uh, we're all messed up. You know, I, we have, we have, uh, my wife has a little sign up in our kitchen area that says, we're just one tent. Uh, our family just one tent short of a full-blown circus you know because <laughs> we're 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 all dysfunctional um we're all broken jesus puts us back together and we just have to remember that he really is ultimately the one that's wanting to help us through all this awesome. thank you, know. you so after spending uh, all the time <clears throat> that you did in around uh, jackson and henderson my <clears throat> last question is what is the best place to eat in that area well if you catfish uh there's no doubt about it you know catfish galley and catfish cabin we miss those we live in the murfreesboro area now right. and they have a lot of good stuff to eat there is not a decent catfish place around here <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah i mean and and the ones and you can tell the difference. I can tell the difference. If you go to a place that the American raised catfish, it's different from getting them in Vietnam. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so I miss that. I, I do that. And then I would definitely um, go to a, a good barbecue place like Jack's Creek uh, outside of Henderson, Tennessee. Okay. I don't know the last time I had catfish. And so now I'm really craving some catfish. <laughs> I caught about a 11 or 12 pounder a couple of days ago. Oh um, man. We were fishing in a, in a pond up at short mountain Bible camp. I've gotten connected with them. I'm on the board now and caught a two nice catfish. Yeah. Right. But the guy, Terry Nash, who's in charge of short mountain. I mean, he's like named all the catfish and you can't keep them, you know? So I caught George and, and Leonard, I think, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they're still swimming. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive into this week's topic. We are dealing with something this week that is is really, I think, one of the more challenging discussions for us as Christians to try to have. 
And I do think it's one that requires us to remember where where truth comes from, what is ultimately our source of truth. And of course, in John 17 and verse 17, in Jesus's prayer to the Father, he says, your word is truth. And to me, that means that no matter what the prevailing winds of culture or politics happen to be, <clears throat> then we still know where the truth comes from, even if that means that sometimes we as Christians are pitted against cultural trends or societal norms. Uh, we have to stand for the truth, ultimately, that is in the Word of God. And I think that's always something good for us to remember in controversial discussions, that the truth doesn't doesn't depend on me. The truth doesn't depend on Jackson or, or you, Ralph. Uh, it depends on the Word of God. Um, yeah, Absolutely. So with that in mind, we're going to dig into this week's topic, which if you've clicked on this and you've seen the title, it's Am I a Man? And Brian introed us at the beginning and he says, this is a podcast where we discuss our Christian identity. This is one that we knew we were going to do for a long time, because currently one of the things in culture that is a hot button topic is gender identity. And so that's what we're going to discuss today, gender identity. We also knew that we wanted somebody who has some good biblical insight <laughs> uh, to help us out with this. So we are also very grateful that Ralph is joining us today to talk about this stuff. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So, right. here. so, Ralph, I think the first question that, that we want to run by you and just let you run with it, and I think it's really a lot of times for Christians, is the first question that gets people tripped up is from a biblical perspective, where does gender come from? Well, we live in a, a time where strange things are afoot at the Circle K, as Bill <laughs> and Ted would say in, in an old movie, Bill and Ted's Most Excellent Adventure. Strange things are afoot. Every day <laughs> reveals something new that we uh, uh, have thought, wow, where in the world did that come from? Um, a teacher was fired uh, recently in Indiana because the teacher refused to use the uh, woke pronouns of a, of a child who had um, gone through the trans uh, transition mm. and uh, therefore was fired because they refused to, to use uh, he or she or whatever the preferred pronoun was for this student at that particular time. And uh, um, just yesterday, I guess it was the, University of Wyoming, maybe it was, um, had uh, there's there's a sorority there that has been sued because they were made to allow a trans member to, to be in the sorority. And according to their charter, you have to be a biological girl in order to do that. Right. And yet they have been sued about this matter. And everywhere you turn, there's something there's uh just noticed there was some schools in florida that um a, a curriculum that was quote unquote woke um was has been banned from some schools there and other people are, are suing because they have been banned and other people are unhappy because it's kind of like who was the greatest coach would it be coach k at north carolina would it be rup at rup arena <laughs> okay if you're talking basketball i mean there's room for disagreement here uh, right. Because obviously there is no thou thus saith the Lord for who is the greatest coach of all time. You know, <laughs> Definitely. In, in, in your part of the world, we know Rupp Arena, you know, uh, in your part uh, of the world is, is very clear to a lot of people and they will just about fight you on who the greatest <laughs> basketball coach is. Well, the same is true with blue states and red states, you know, Republican versus Democrats. And there's room for a lot of disagreement in a lot of areas in life. But when God speaks to a matter, um, then that means that I have to listen to what he says. And what I believe or don't believe about it is not going to change what it says. Right. And and therefore, if the Bible says that God has made them male and female, which it does in Genesis 2, then regardless of what culture I'm from or whether I'm from a blue state or a red state, none of that is going to change the text. The text is still going to be the text. 
I think of the song Ancient Words. Um, talked about this some when I spoke at CYC recently. Um, and we talked about the fact, look, when it at the end of the day, you know, regardless of of what's going on in our world, here are anchor points that God has given to us that are not gonna change. You know, you know what is gonna change? Uh, Amazon's gonna put more and more businesses out of business. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. you know, ask, ask Sears and JC Penny. Absolutely. You know, at the, end, at the end of the day, you know, that's gonna happen. At some point, Jeff Bezos or whatever his name is at Amazon, he's not gonna be the head of it anymore. And there might be another company that will come along and there'll be another change. Um, I got four daughters, I jokingly say, because we don't want five, but, that's, uh, <laughs> but we, we do have four daughters and we have eight grandchildren and one on the way. So, uh, love all of those kids, the world that they are in, however, is much different from the world that I grew up in. The world that I grew up in didn't have a, uh, you know, a, a Pinterest, didn't have a Chipotle, didn't have a, uh, <laughs> Panera bread, you know, right. didn't have any of this random stuff. We had buffets because God made buffets. Right. Right? But, but why, why is it? And in the world that I grew up in, you didn't buy water. I mean, it was stupid to buy water because the water is so pure around there. Why would you buy water? Exactly. And, and, then, and then there's, you know, I know that when our kids come, we're going to have to have some, some bought water in the refrigerator because times have changed. I understand that. And I am a product of that, and I am a student of that. But there's still the Bible. So the Bible says about this, that gender is still going to be gender, and that my psychological attitude about it is not going to change the biology behind it. Right. So psychology is a, a very important of who I think I am, In my mind, I know that I've struggled with this myself personally, not with gender identity, but with uh, confidence. I have struggled with confidence, and I know that that it's a big issue. But guys, um, the you know, Brother Marshall Keeble used to say the Bible is right. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. he's famous, famous evangelist. The Bible is right, and and so who am I to step out on a limb and say, Hey God, you messed up here. You didn't know about gender dysphoria. You didn't know about gender fluidity. Um, You didn't know about what was going to be happening in our world with the proper pronouns and all this stuff. Uh, But at the end of the day, you know, you can cave in if you like, but it's still going to be God made them male and female. Absolutely. Okay. I think one of the issues that, that we face in dealing with this question is that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the Bible says God made them male and female, period. Uh, that's that's, that's right. all that, that needs to be said about it. But what we're dealing with today is that more and more people want to define gender based on a feeling. And so we end up having this situation where we have objective reality pitted against subjective feelings and and i find that to be uh, odd that we would allow something that is so subjective as how we feel about something to dictate gender over the objective truths of the, and the objective reality that is around us do you do you have anything to to say about that sure um something st- is wrong when a swimmer who is ranked maybe number 84 in the country goes through gender reassignment surgery and then starts winning swimming meets as a woman right and and that's just one case out of many many as jackson tell us your experience about uh, disc golf right so currently there's a litigation going on about uh a transgender person who wants to play disc golf, but in the female professional open. And that's problematic because as a male, you just have a disposition to be stronger and you can, you can throw further. And so it's just, it's simply not fair. 
<laughs> um, and yeah. it's, it's creating a lot of problems because uh, there are women that have been practicing for years and years and years to be able to compete at the level that they do compete. And then to have somebody who is very similar to that swimmer, I think it was Leah Thomas or something to then just come over and start winning. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 you're right. It's not going on, that's going on now in the cycling world, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, we're not saying that men are superior to women. We're saying that men have more upper body strength, generally speaking. Yeah. Because yeah, right. they are women that can put me down in an arm wrestling match. Right. I know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're not saying that women are not strong. We are saying that generally speaking, men have a higher center of gravity, biologically speaking, and they have more upper body strength, biologically speaking, although women um can uh in most all tests they can go through pain better than men yes uh, and then are better in a, in a in a lot of ways than men are so we're not making that point we are making a point however that it is just not fair for a cyclist for instance to be able who's um, a transgender person to be competing as a female whenever there's he has uh, an inherent advantage and because right. of that you know, that's a problem it's, you know, have you seen people who've had their legs amputated and they've had these artificial limbs that, that are put on the bottom? They're like springs. Yes. Okay. And a person who, who does that really well can outrun virtually anybody. Right. And the reason why is, is they got the advantage of, of those springs. Well, if you were to say, uh, let's let that person compete against everybody else. Well, if that person knows what they're doing, they're going to beat anybody else in the field. <laughs> Why? Because you're, you're gonna be faster right right um all right so anyway all right so what i'm talking about here has nothing to do with inferiority and superiority it has to do with biology uh this is the way that god has made it now with regard to transgender people here's my opinion my opinion would be better if transgender surgeries now, you could have transgender therapy um, that's not surgical, but I don't think that a minor should undergo a transgender a gender reassignment surgery because this is a decision that he or she needs to make after they're 18 years old. Because when mama and daddy make this decision for them, in most cases, these surgical procedures, uh, gender reassignment surgeries are irreversible. Right. And the suicide rate among uh, trans people is seven times higher than the ordinary suicide rate. Mm. There's a reason for that. It is not just that they are not, you know, accepted by society or culture, because culture is really, as you know, with the the Bud Light stuff, uh, <laughs> there's a group of, uh, of the society that is, is willing it is really willing to accept them. Right. So what's happening here? Well, in many cases, mom and dad have made a choice for this child that this child should have made for himself or herself. Right. At an age when they were mature enough to be making the choice. Right. That's one of, right. That's one right. of the things that not I've heard consistently. Were, not when they were 10 years old. Right. right. Yeah. One thing that I've heard consistently is, is what you said, but people who uh, go through this surgery, even even at an age where they're able to make that decision and, and be well informed about it they still regret undergoing that surgery. They wish that they had it. They wish they, the, what I'm trying to say is the feeling is fleeting. It, it, it changes. They feel like they shouldn't have, but it's too late. <laughs> I won't be really blunt here, but I think it's okay for this audience to, to talk about chemical castration. Mm. All right. Now that's a, a procedure uh, that is necessary if a male wishes to become a female. There is no such thing as chemi chemical uncastration. Right. You know, once you have had it, then this decision has been made for you until something would develop in the future that could re that could replace what you have lost. Right. So in every case of gender reassignment, you're losing some body parts in order to try to gain some other body parts which may or may not fix the problems that are psychological in nature. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, as, as we're trying to talk about the question that we are looking at this week as, am I a man? You know, one of the things that is 
a strange development within this gender identity discussion is that for the longest time, it seemed like as a culture, we were trying to allow more and more diversity within what it takes to be a man or what it takes to be a woman and mm -hmm. trying to not have limiting stereotypes. And yet in the gender identity discussion, for those who are promoting transgenderism, it seems that they are actually promoting a much narrower definition of what it means to be a man or a woman. Even though you may be biologically a man or a woman, or let's say if you're biologically a man, but you don't feel like the stereotypical manly man, then that must mean you're a woman. And what All right. a, what a, what a, oh, it's, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say what a, what a strange twist that is. Uh, it is a strange twist that they should be encouraging diversity. When, as a matter of fact, it seems as though the definition of what a male is and what a female is is getting more and more narrow. Right. Hey, let's let's think about what psychologists, some psychologists, some of them, maybe not most of them, of, of sure, but let's think about what some psychologists especially those who are sympathetic to gender reassignment surgery, what they would have said to Jacob and Esau. Right. So let's go to Genesis 25. All right. And uh, would you read that passage for us, Jackson, if you don't mind about yes. Jacob and Esau? It says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful, hunt skillful hunter, a man of the field, while yeah. Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die of what, of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went away. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. All right. And by the way, uh, Jacob is not a weenie. No. Because <laughs> I was going to. Right. He's holding on to the heel of his brother as his brother exit, exits the birth canal first. All right. right. And so that's what the word Yaakov means in Hebrew is he who holds on to the heel. Right. All right. So uh, he's not a weak guy. But uh, he likes to watch um, the HGTV, right? You know, yeah. out on the phone. I mean, <laughs> you know that he likes. You know, he's he's a guy who likes the tent stuff, and so he likes the home stuff. And he 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 watches the Cooking Network and and kind of stuff like that. But he is very much a guy, and he's very much a strong guy. Now, here's the assignment that that I gave to us to talk about, and that is, if you were a person who had dealt with uh, recommending gender reassignment surgeries in the past, well, what would you have said to this guy? Well, what That's do you a think? a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah. they they might, if he was struggling psycho psychologically, if he was struggling with the fact that he's not like Esau, that he's not the outdoorsman, that he's not the quote-unquote manly man, then uh, they, they might would tell him, hey, uh, maybe you, you're not a man. <laughs> yeah so when he's going through target you know he's going on a different toy aisle than some of uh your other children uh <laughs> right i know that you know it's sometimes we encourage them to do that but my mother gave me a doll on my 30th birthday you know and and so i grew up with with her giving me dolls and i'm thinking mother you know <laughs> please don't do that. i'm trying to play football i'll be a guy you know, I'm trying to hurt other people. I'm trying to be hurt. You know, I'm trying to be a guy and you're giving me dolls and stuff. Why are you doing that? Okay. I don't know. Even to this day, this, that's a true story. Uh, even to this day, I, I don't know if she knew that we were going to have four daughters. I'm sure she didn't, but, um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it did, it did help me some. So what that means then brothers is that there's a wide variety of men who are still men. Right. 
Uh, Jesus uh, addresses this also in Matthew 19 when he quotes Genesis 2. Uh, he addresses this uh, whenever the Pharisees come to him and they try to put him in the dilemma about divorce and remarriage. And so he says, you know, in verse four there, have you not read? I mean, in other words, don't you know the Bible says this? <laughs> Uh, if you knew the Bible says this, then why are you asking me this? Right. Right? Don't you know that the Bible says that God made them male and female, and therefore what God has joined together, not man separate, and therefore you don't be a part of separate. So he he pursues it further. Now, in the process of the discussion, after the passage that is uh, you know more controversial to some because of it's about divorce and remarriage, we read further, and he says, um, then, then they said to him, well, it would be better not to marry, maybe, but if if you're demanding so much of a husband and wife. And then he says, not everyone can receive this saying in verse 11, but only those to whom it is given, for there are eunuchs that have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. In other words, there was a wide variety. Sometimes a person could uh, undergo voluntary castration. Sometimes they were born differently, whatever it is. But Jesus admits that the male category is broader than what is sometimes not every male likes to hunt and fish. Right. So <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're not a man. If you were born a biological male, it does not mean that. And we should not make a person feel uh, that way. I know that probably all of us have uh, been brought up with boys that were um, uh, not exactly effeminate, but a little different in their gesticulation right. um, than other guys. And maybe they cross their legs a little differently, whatever. And I'm telling you, we're, you know, guys are brutal. <laughs> you know, to other guys, to yes. other guys yeah. do that, and it has made, in many cases, people feel very uncomfortable with who they are. I am right. not; none of us on this panel are advocating any sort of abuse to anyone, even if they are a trans person. Right? We are not indicating that they should be abused in any way because if they have been through the transgender surgery. Uh, it may not be reversible. Now, if they are the way they are because of, of hormone induction, then hormones can be stopped. Right. But there are some things that cannot be reversed. And therefore, the point is you have to love the person um, as they are, uh, just like we all are. We're all sinners. That doesn't mean that we don't have to change if we're doing wrong. Right. It just doesn't exactly. mean that we're all made in the image of God. Right. Yeah. How would you recommend Christians have these conversations with people? Because um, sometimes people will come at us kind of hot because they think we hold a particular stance. And to sometimes we engage them in a way that isn't fruitful. Sometimes maybe we do. But what what would you say is the best way we should have conversations about the Bible regarding gender? Well, my suggestion at CYC this year, I've tried to study this a lot, having, uh, you see, my first association with people in the LGBTQ community was when I was a student at Fried Hardeman. Um, yeah, believe it or not, even at Christian schools, there are people who struggle. They sure. struggle with their sexual identity. They struggle with their uh, with their who they are in their mind. And I am thinking right now of a good friend. Um, I lived at Fried Hardman during a time when one of our dorms you could have three. We had three guys in there, and one of the three of us had had a sexual affair with a guy outside of our dorm room on campus. And um, I was called before the discipline committee to testify on his behalf or to accuse him if he had had any problems in, in inside our room while we were dorming to get, while we were in the dorm together. 
Well, I said to them, uh, you know, he has been no problem to the other two of us. He has not come on to us sexually. He has not been a problem. He's a friend. He's a Bible major. He's a preacher. Um, but we knew uh, after this happened um, that he had an affair with another guy on campus. By the way, the other guy on campus died of AIDS. Mm. Um, and uh, and the guy that I'm talking about, who was my friend and former roommate, um, he died of cirrhosis of the liver um, because he never could come to terms with with uh, who he was and he felt condemned all the time and um he drank himself to death uh, uh was very sexually promiscuous and stuff although i loved him in the biblical in the biblical sense of the word so don't say to me you don't have any experience with this because you don't know me right and you don't you don't know the students that i've talked to at Fried Hardeman about this um, so I would say that the first thing that you need to understand is that affirming somebody as a person does not mean that you are approving of their actions. So affirmation is different from endorsement. Uh, that would be true with, uh, with anybody in your family that's not living the way that you'd want them to live. That's true with anybody who's in a sinful situation and that they are, are not willing to change, you know, uh, that you still say, look, I love you as a person. I, I love you because you're made in the image of God. I love you because you have precious qualities and I'm still whatever happens to you. I'm going to do that through the years. This person that I am talking to you about would get in a desperate situation. I remember one night he was uh, beaten up by some other guys who were uh, apparently of a gay persuasion because he was at a gay bar. He told me they beat him up and robbed him and did some bad other bad things to him and left him in a place outside of town, maybe 45 minutes or so, and he called me to come to get him. And I did. And um, And so the thing is, guys is that you still have to love and love and love and love some more in the biblical sense of the word. And they've got to understand you may be trans, but you're welcome in our assembly as long as you don't try to encourage us to change what the Bible says. Right. You are welcomed in our youth group. You are work welcome here. It's going to present some uncomfortable things for where you go to the bathroom in our youth group and other things that we'd have to work out. You know, the other parents would have to be on board with the situation. But even if you are a trans child, you are still a child. And therefore, we have to try to find a way to make this work, because right now it's cool to be gay and it's kind of cool to be trans. And I think that there are st um, young people that are that are pushed in that direction because of um, unhappiness in their homes um, right. or unhappiness, especially with the male or uh, with the male figure or the female figure in their home. And so if they can't find a place at church, well, what's going to happen to them? So I'm thinking then that we have to try to have intentional discussions about what can we do to welcome people to come to church without indicating to them that we're not going to compromise on what the Bible says. So that's the first point. Can you affirm without endorsing? And then that's going to bring up a whole nother set of questions. Well, what does that look like at Christmas? Right. Or what does that look like at Thanksgiving? So um, it's going to, it's going to complicate in some sense, our discussions at church is going to stretch a little bit the boundaries of our, of our fellowship. <clears throat> I've said many times before, there's a difference in a, in a gay who is practicing and in a gay who's non-practicing, right? A practicing, a non-practicing gay should be able to be recognized as your brother or sister in Christ, period. 
<clears throat> now, if they are practicing and advocating that lifestyle, then that's a different matter. Right. So it has to do with affirming as much as you can, loving as much as you can, you know, compassion, not compromise. Figure out a way to have the compassion without the compromise. Right, right. There's just so many unique approaches to this that I think that we have to just really think. So this is weird. Things. After a person, man, my mind's racing here. And, and at my age, that's at a very slow pace. But my <laughs> mind is racing here about what about a person who's had gender reassignment surgery and it's non-reversible? Could they still have a monogamous relationship with somebody? Wow. Um, mm. And the answer is, yeah, they could. Now, whether or not I like to think about that, no. <laughs> but would it be possible? Are we saying to them, you have to be single, or you have to be um, the rest of your life, uh, you have to not be with any person because you've had this gender reassignment surgery? Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking monogamy. Mm -hmm. Um Whatever that looks like, I'm not quite sure. And I'm probably getting your, uh, I'm probably adding to the confusion of your listeners. <laughs> but I want, <laughs> I want your listeners to know that we are willing to listen. Absolutely. Right. Well, that, I think yeah. that's where a lot of issues yeah. with having discussions starts is people who struggle with this don't feel like Christians listen. They feel like, well, here's a lot of times they feel like this is what the Bible says. Take it, use it. You should you should be able to figure it out. It out. And, and so listening does play a, a pivotal part. And then the other thing is something that I think it, un, unless we're able to have a discussion with somebody who holds the scripture in high regard, it's going to be difficult to convince them that what the Bible says is actually good, right and beneficial. And so there's a lot that has to go on on the front end before you can move into that becoming a if Christian they don't conversation. Have, yeah. The, at some point, if, if they are not Christians, if we can't bring them to the point of uh, respecting what this says, then your opinion is no different from theirs. Right. right. Exactly. I right. mean, this whole discussion started out with, well, what does Ralph think? Well, that's not really all that important. Or Brian or Jack. <laughs> the, the more important thing is, are we speaking in a way that would honor God? And that's right. what we're trying to do. All right. Well, I think uh, the last thing that I want to bring up is a quote that I read recently that I, I really like in in relation to the way that we as Christians address this issue. It says Christians must respond by offering a positive biblical worldview that affirms the value of the body. And at the same time, Christians should be the first in line to nurture and support kids who don't fit in by affirming the diversity of gifts and temperaments in the body of Christ. I think that's a that's a really powerful statement in as we talked about the differences between Jacob and Esau, the differences between all of us. And mm -hmm. it's OK to be different. It's OK to be uh, diverse. But ultimately, the word of God is very clear on biological male, sure. biological female. That's right. And the biology you know, things have changed. The biology has not. Right. <laughs> now, we want to love people, but we want them to also to understand that if your biology is still your biology, then who's going to be able to help you with your thinking better than Jesus? I Absolutely. Mean, uh, he's the best there is. So right. Uh, right. I, I do affirm the the uh, excellent qualities. You know, I tried to be a professional myself when I was teaching. I got the highest degree that I could in the area that I was teaching uh, in philosophy. 
So I do believe in having academic credentials, and I believe that I'm believing in being competent in what you're doing. And I do believe that many psychologists and psychiatrists are competent. But that doesn't mean that I think that they're going to ever change the biology behind gender. Right, right. All right, Jackson, do you have any I, final I, thoughts? I don't. Uh, I enjoy having episodes like this where we're able to have have a guest, uh, especially someone who's who's been a professor. I love listening. I love learning. I hope our listeners have been able to to learn something as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we we thank you so much, uh, Ralph, for being with us. We really appreciate you being here. And um, for asking me, I appreciate it very much. And, and I've we, been there at that congregation before, and uh, you are good people. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. We want to thank all of our listeners for listening to this week's episode. We hope that it has been beneficial to you in some way, and it's going to help you grow in your faith and grow in your identity as a follower of Jesus. Have a blessed day.